Good morning and welcome. I'm Larry Rosini. I'm the director of the Tennessee Small Business Development Center. We are one of the partners here in the chamber, and our job or our function is to introduce great speakers such as Steve, amongst a lot of other things. We're very pleased that you have chosen to participate in our Bright Ideas series, which is various types of classes every month on different business disciplines that we feel would be very beneficial to uh, the small business community. And we couldn't start out the season with a better presenter than Steve Herzog. Uh, I want to read his bio, first of all, because I don't believe half of it. Yeah. <laughs> Steve and I go way back, uh, over 18 years or so. Uh, Steve came to the Small Business Development Center when he first decided to buy this franchise, he said, uh, Larry, what do you think? And I said, it would never work. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I thought it was uh, one of the number one things, if you'll remember, I said, the number one thing I see small businesses lacking in is the ability to sell what they do. And so if you can teach the business community how to do that, you'll have a win. And he's been trying to do that for 18 years or so. So uh, I'll just read his bio, and then I'll let Steve Entertaining, it's wow, whatever. I struggle. I struggle. I struggle. Steve Herzog, president of Herzog and Associates, an authorized licensee of Sandler Sales, brings over 37 years of direct sales, sales and marketing management, and engineering experiences to the firm's clients. Steve is a former corporate vice president of sales and marketing who brings a wealth of experience to his training sessions. Steve earned his bachelor's degree at State University College of New York at Buffalo and in industrial engineering, and he also holds a master's degree in business from Niagara University. Having sold the Fortune 100 company as well as the small businesses over the last 20 years, Steve is an experienced management professional in not only sales, but in marketing management, strategic planning, product development, and manufacturing engineering. Steve left the corporate track almost 18 years, established Herzog and Associates and licensee of Sandler Sales Institute. His organization helped professionals and companies learn more effective non-traditional sales management strategies for their business. Offering powerful and unique methods, Steve has not only significantly helped grow hundreds of area companies' sales, but has and instrumental in changing whole businesses to highlight and profitable situations. Steve remains in the top 10% of 280 franchises worldwide in performance and is past president of the Franchise Advisory Council Executive Committee representing all Sandler franchises worldwide. Please join me in welcoming you Steve Perkins. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awful nice to be here. Um, I don't know what happened to these three people. They were really going to get hammered. But uh, uh, I want to make this as uh, much value as I can for you all here today. Uh, you are in a class or a session, if you will, that's going to be involved in, in selling, the dynamics of selling. Uh, are you all in the right place? Are you all happy to be selling when you're selling? Yeah, good. Okay. Well, what I try to do in the next hour and 20 minutes or so is I'm going to give you all I got in terms of helping you out. Obviously, an hour and 20 minutes is a whole heck of a lot, given the fact that training is usually ongoing for up to three years and probably, uh, probably 200 hours of uh, training that we provide to our clientele. Um, but I'll give you some snippets, things I think you can walk away with and hopefully use that will be of value to you. Um, You'll hear to notice as we go along, a lot of what we discuss is going to be about human psychology. Uh, the foundation of what we have and how we've developed our selling processes and what we learn has more to do with dealing with people than anything else because if you really boil it down, all we're doing when we're selling is dealing with another person or another group of people. And the dynamics of people with people is what selling is all about. So what I like about what I share is that it's not just regarding selling, it's regarding communication, it's regarding life, it's regarding how you deal with your spouse or your children, uh, you, you, 
typically see it overflows into those areas. Because all it is, and all that selling is, is really understanding people as best you can. And that's the foundation of what we teach, and you're going to see some of that here today. Before I get started, because this is what I hate when I'm in your shoes and I want to learn something, is I want to walk away something from me. In order for me to do that, I want to learn a little bit from you all. So this is what I'd like to do, is you all came here for a reason. Um, you're looking for something. I want to see if I can't deliver on that. Does anyone have on their mind something they'd like me to address with regard to selling? From the time you pick up the phone to talk to someone, to the time you go through the process of meeting them with them, maybe multiple times, and either getting the sale or not, it's within that realm. I'm not going to address marketing issues here today, it will be sales related. But from the time you pick up the phone to the time you get business or you don't, what's bugging you? What's causing you challenges? Quick, yes sir? Is there any way to find out <clears throat> what they're not telling you that you really need to know? <laughs> yeah, they're hold, they hold back, don't they? Um, so, uh, if, I, if I could reword what I think you're saying is, how do I, how do I get them, how do I get them <clears throat> to open up and share with me what's really on their mind? Is that okay if I say that? Yeah, that's good. That's, that's a very good point. Uh, we're we'll going to get into why it is or not. You know, it's kind of interesting what's going on there. We'll discuss that. Good, good one. Thank you. What else? Yes, sir. Cold calling uh, through franchisors. Um, Cold calling and franchisors. They've not heard of your concept. They're not familiar with the concept. You've got 30 seconds to sell. And your question would be, what do I do in that first 30 seconds to give me the best advantage? Good, good. Okay. Uh, 30 seconds, phone call. What can I best say to get their attention? <coughs> Of a relationship <coughs> competition has with my prospect. 
Uh, could they be an incumbent, or are they buying for the same sale you are? Incumbent, or just a another uh, vendor who's offering the same type of services. So that's again, how do I separate myself, right, from the other, from the competition? All right, that's a good one. Man, you all got, I'm so glad you've got some questions. Very good, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm going to really work to try to address that. I think I can. Um, we'll get into it. Sandler training has been around for 40 years, and we've developed these things called rules and insights to selling. And there's 248 rules and insights. I know one, every one of them. They're all numbered, and I know them in order. No <laughs> But I do remember a lot of them, and that brings up a few for you, sir, so I'll well remember that. What else? Anyone else has got this burning desire to want to say, Steve, please help me. I have a problem with that. Because the rest of you have not brought anything up. You're just here for the lunch. Right? I mean, Heather doesn't have any challenges or issues. I do. I was going to say competition. I, come on. Competition? What competition? Well, when, when I call someone... How do we again handle that unhappy? Good. Because by the way, 50% or more of the people you get in front of to sell, more than likely, will tell you they're happy. Now, you can do one of two things, accept it, and then they've sold you on the fact they're happy, and you bought it. Or you didn't fail to sell them on what it is you've got that's different. It's one of the two. So a sale is made every time, as they say, right? Did you have one, sir? Yes. Uh, Good way to be memorable to that individual student. How is it that I can be remember after our, our initial meeting where something does come up, I would be the first one in their mind? How do I make an impression so that we remember? going to be very much in concert with a lot of us. Thank you. Yes, sir? I have going in that I'm going to be about 99% of the time significantly higher than any of my competition. When you say higher, you mean like you want to hire? No, I don't know. It's only in Colorado. No, price. Price! So you know you're like the highest price. Yes. And your question is? Get them past looking. How do I get them past the price? Well, first of all, would they know before they met you that you're high priced? Usually they don't. They, they don't. don't. But it ends up being a big issue sometime in there. All right, so here's rule number one that comes to mind. It's not in order here, but of the 248 rules, I, I'm going to help you right now on this one. All right? If there is a bomb and it's going to blow, let's diffuse it before it blows. Another way to put that is, if there's an elephant in the room and we're not addressing the elephant, let's bring it on out of the corner and let's look at the elephant, talk about the elephant, feel the elephant, and discuss the stinking elephant. In this case, my price is always high. I'm higher than almost all the competition. So here you go, and this is counterintuitive. Some of the things I'm going to share with you all today, you're going to walk away and go, that guy is crazy. I'm crazy smart, but understand it's all a process. And what I'm doing is giving you little vignettes. One vignette, my friend, is to really be kind and discuss that up front. Let's confuse the bomb before it blows up. And your name is, sir? Jay. Jay? Jay? Yes. So I might say, Jay, uh, I'm glad you, you invited me in here today. Uh, obviously, I'm going to ask some questions. I want to learn more about you know, what your interests are. But can I share something up front that comes up regularly when I meet with the people like yourself? Can I talk about that now? You say? Yes. Sure. Yes. Jay, I'm expensive. In fact, you'll find that I'm probably more expensive than anyone else out there. Should we continue talking? Boom. <laughs> What would, if you want to be an average customer you get in front of, Jay, what might they say? Uh, the average customer does want the best seafood. That 
Okay. So then they would say what in this role play, if you don't mind a role play moment? Sure. Uh, we're looking at trial sets. You know, we're looking at bidders. We get to bid. Once they start saying bids, I'm usually more expensive than that. <coughs> what should we do? It's going to be high. It sounds like you're not sure you want me to leave it for if it were high. I, I'm sorry to hear that. I appreciate the fact that you're being straight up and honest with me. Thank you for sharing that. Could I ask you one last question? Why do you think people pay what they pay for our product, for our service? If you had to guess. Uh, quality of service. Quality of service. That's very good. We're the best. No one's better. Good point. Anything else? We may not can afford the best. You may not be able to afford the best. And that's fair. And you may not. And that's okay. Usually we find that out down the road, but it sounds like this is going to be a short meeting. So what would you like me to do next? Go ahead and leave us alone. I'd be happy to. What would you like it to what would you like it to be in there? Or what would you like it for it to be in there? What were you looking for? What do you want in the quote? Comprehensive service for our facility. Could I, could I ask you a few questions on that, Chad? Sure. What are you looking for in comprehensive services? That's where I'm going to start. He hasn't kicked me out, so I might as well continue the conversation. Now he knows what. What's one thing he knows? <coughs> I'm high priced, but he's still talking to me. Now, I'm not saying I'll get this business. I may not, but <coughs> wouldn't we rather just find that out now? Because I'm guessing, Jay, I'm guessing somehow accidentally you do sell now and then, even at a high price. Oh, People buy. Why do you think they buy? For all the things that you already know, but you got to get them to talk about it. So that's a quick role play. What I'm trying to give you an example of here is, listen, let's be up front. Let's be, let's be blatantly, blatantly honest. You know, if you're high priced in this example, boom, I bring that up, let's defuse the bomb right now. And you'd be amazed. Not all the time, but most of the time, they're still willing to talk to you. Because we know what? If you're high priced, what might you be? A better value? You know, a better service? A better, do you, listen. When you all buy things, you all buy on price, right? No? Not necessarily. So sometimes you do, and sometimes you don't. So I think everyone would agree with that. So sometimes you buy in price, but sometimes you don't. Well, I got a rule for you, another rule of the 248. You've got to get this in your head as good professionals. No one ever buys on just price. Never. And don't accept that. And don't get that into your head that you think they do. The minute you do as a professional, you're losing control of the sale. Because if it's in your head, well, they might buy on price. <coughs> Guess where the conversation is going to eventually go? On price. Exactly where it shouldn't go. Because people don't buy on price. They buy on ways to avoid whatever pain, issue, challenge, roadblock, hurdle that they currently have. They don't buy on price. So I know this is hard for some of you because you're sitting there going, well, Steve, I, I buy on price. I know people buy my product or service on price. Stop it. Why are you doing that to yourself? Stop it. They don't buy on price. It's your job to find out what else they buy on. Stop it. Because you hurt yourself. You hurt yourself. Now, I'm not even clicking through these darn slides. So we got we to do something. All right. Um, <laughs> Does anyone else have anything burning you want me to put up? Otherwise, I'm going to kick this off and go. And as I go along, I'll do my best to address these items. We're all okay? Comfortable? Comfortable? Yes. Sunny. How can I forget Sunny? What a nice day. Beautiful day today. Thank you for it. <laughs> okay, let's see. There we go. Uh, what we're going to hope today is, uh, you know, I always like to start out with an idea of what we're going to try to accomplish. So uh, I already told you about this uh, a professional selling system that allows both prospect and salesperson to get their needs met. Uh, we, we have a saying that 
we're here on a mutual beneficial way and a mutual basis of respect. <clears throat> so we should always be a, a, of equivalent status when we're selling and when we're buying or when we're with a prospect that's buying. We shouldn't feel subservient as a sales professional. You should e gain equal respect, is what we're, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So at the end of this uh, session today, hopefully you'll be able to describe our selling system. I'm gonna go through that. We'll list the benefits, of course, of using a system. Um, some of you have a way to sell. Uh, certainly it looks like some of you have been around the block a little bit here. So you probably have a way of selling now, which by the way is better than no way. Uh, there are salespeople who show up and they don't know what they're going to do, and they don't have a set process. I'm here to tell you this, and you're going to learn more about it. If you don't show up with a process to sell, you're going to default to the buyer system of buying, and it isn't pretty, because we'll talk more about what goes on when people buy. Would it make sense if we knew more about how people bought, we'd do a better job being able to sell to them? Keely, what do you think? If we knew how they bought and knew more about that, Maybe we can learn more about how to sell them. So that's what we're going to learn today, is how people buy. All right. <clears throat> so a system is a process to develop an opportunity. Um, I don't really like giving slides too often, but I knew I had a big group here. Um, so we want to create a process, a systematic series of actions, defines how to get something gets done. Again, a process of sale, a process of, of meeting with people and going through this this meeting of people. <clears throat> Provided, provides an order of specific actions, all right? Um, these are all aspects of a system itself. <clears throat> an effective system enables you to consistently achieve a desired, a desired outcome and a set of outcomes. You know where you are in the selling process if you have a system. And it's always good to know where you are rather than scratching your head going, now what do I do? And I mean, we all have that. Uh, an efficient system. An efficient system allows us to achieve those outcomes without wasting resources, time, energy, money. Let me ask you all, every time you get in front of a prospect, do you sell them? Does anyone do 100% close rate here? No? Okay, not unusual. So, if I were to give you a way to find those people who don't buy from you, to find out who they are sooner, would that be of interest to you? Would that be a benefit to you? Listen, there's 100 people you get in front of. You already know and will agree some of those aren't going to buy. And whatever the number is, 20, 40, 60, don't buy, whatever the number is. Well, they're, they're going to be called no's, right? Would you like to have a way to understand that they're not going to buy earlier on in the sale rather than later on in the sale? Would that be of interest to anyone here? I would think it would be. Wouldn't it be neat if we could find that? Oh, I got a signing sheet. If you want to be on my newsletter list, some people do. If you don't want to, that's fine. You won't offend me. But put your name, your email, and your phone number down, and I'll put you on my email list if you'd like to. And if you just pass that around. Okay. So um, we've got to find out no's quicker, faster, sooner. We're going to find out a way to do that. <clears throat> because I know this, I don't want to waste my time. I want to be in front of people who stand a better chance of buying than not, and those that are not, I'd like to find out sooner. <clears throat> so benefits of the selling system. I, I feel like I'm kind of hammering it here. We're going to just, you know what? you got to have a system. I don't need to go through all these slides. So uh, you can save time on the selling system. <clears throat> really banging this hard, of course. You stay on track with the selling system. You know where you are in the process. You can recognize problems early on so that they can be addressed if you have a system. You can focus your energy on your prospect rather than worry about what you need to be doing next. One thing I can share to you all, and you mean well by it, but you've got to be hyper-driven to be prospect-centered, not eye-centered. <clears throat> now, yes, you've got to bring a system, and that would be something you need to do, but that system is only there for you to know more about them, not for you to give 
your knowledge away, which we're going to talk about. Salespeople are very proud of their knowledge. Sir, what's your name? This is yes. Brent. Yes. Brent? Yes. Do you mind asking what do you do? Uh, we have a talent agency. Talent agency? Yeah. What kind of talent are you looking for? Everybody. Four days. <laughs> wow. So, uh, tell me a little bit more about this. We just bring people in and max them up with clients later that want to go out and have the uh, balance be on their projects. Tell me more specific. Give me an example. See, right, calls and says we need somebody to come out and be on a boat half a day and do something with four people. We need two guys, two girls, two ages. Wow, wow, wow. I got it. Okay, thank you for that. Now I understand. Um, so, uh, what's important for you, obviously, is when you get in front of these people, that they're going to pick up the phone and call you when they need you. And that's what you're trying to get done, is to know that they're going to be top of mind uh, when they have a need for your services. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you get in front of them and they go, I have a great now, we don't need anything. So how do we, that's another awkward sale, because if they're happy, happy now, and they don't need anything, then what do we do later? You know, how do we come back? Even if they say, yeah, yeah, we'll use you, you know what happens, right? They say that and then they don't. Right. We want to duplicate successful behavior. You'll do that in the system. Uh, saves you in the prospect time of doing stuff. Uh, This is great. Having a system you can strategize and debrief. Uh, here's a little tidbit for you. None of you have asked about this, but it will do wonders for you. As salespeople, we're always rushed. And we're rushed, 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 rushed. And we pull up in front of the, the prospect, let's say, and we're pulling in the parking lot. We get out of the parking lot. We head on in and we go for it, right? Well, maybe what we do is what's called the two-minute, two-minute drill. Let's just take two minutes. Pull up into the parking lot, turn the car off, stop, two minutes. What am I doing here? What's my objective? What kind of result am I looking for from this meeting? It's called the two minute, two minute drill. Just get your head about you. Give yourself two minutes. We don't do it. If you just did every time, why am I here? What's my objective? You'd be amazed. That itself can help you a lot. Then you go in and you do the best you can, right? You come out, and then we really turn on the car, race off to the next, go grab lunch, whatever, make return phone calls, da da da. Stop! Get your wits about you. After the call, two minutes, how'd I do? Did I get a clear future? What was the result of me? What could I have done better? What could I have asked that I didn't ask? What should I have asked? How did he feel or she feel? What was my sense of the call? <laughs> Ask yourself these questions. Just take two minutes. You'd be amazed if you did that, the learning curve goes up. Because you're now self-coaching. And you all can self-coach to an extent you can. <laughs> Systems replicable, that's important. Because you've got to get other people to know about it. And they've got to learn it and use it. <clears throat> All right. What I'm about to give you here is gold. All right? This is gold. You didn't even ask for this, but it will help you in your sales calls. All right? When you have a meeting with someone, let's say it's a sales meeting, a sales call, you get one of four outcomes in every meeting. One of four outcomes, nothing more. One outcome is you could get a yes, right? Yes, they're going to buy, blah, blah, PO, all that great stuff can happen. Or you could get a no. No is they're not buying. It's, I'm, I'm not buying from you, I'm buying from so-and-so, whatever it may be. Which, by the way, are you okay with getting no's? I mean, you're, you know you're going to get some, right? So I want you to start to think about something. I want you to get no's more regularly. I want you to own no. I want you to love no. I want you to hug no. I want you to really be okay with no. I want you to love getting no's. And I mean, I'm not just saying act like it, I'm saying in your heart, 
really, really be okay with really getting those. And you will be amazed. There are ways to get to that level, and when you do, you will find a whole new way of selling. Because it relinquishes you from all the pressure you put on yourself. More than you know in the sale. Listen, one of the things buyers hate are needy salespeople. You all know when you're buyers and you're in front of a needy salesperson, we know what that's like. It's, it's slimy. It's, good gosh, right? So I want you to be the opposite. You don't need it. I want you to start to build a mentality is, I'd love to have this business, but if I don't get it, I'll get the next one. It's okay. In fact, this is probably something I'm not going to get. In fact, I'm showing up and I think it's going to be a no. I know this sounds strange. It's counterintuitive. It's not what you normally do. Listen, if you could really start to think about this, there's whole new vistas that open up in sales. If you really understand this concept of really being okay with getting a no and actually asking questions along the lines of getting no, it'll do wonders for your sales. Are you all ready to just get out of here now? I mean, this is, this is, this is a good case. It's difficult to get people to say no. It, it is. Because why, why is that, particularly in East Tennessee, right? You know what? So what do they say if they don't say no? We've heard this. Check back with me. Call me. Email me. Send me some brochures. Give me information. Give me a proposal. Call me next week. Call me in two weeks. Call me when my renewal comes up. Blah, 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 blah. It's all crap. And you're taking it. Our, our job as pros is to think about this. As I, you know, everyone thinks they got to sell when they're in sales. Guess what? The number one thing you're not supposed to do. So, stop it. I know. I know you're going to throw up. Some of you are about to get really mad. <clears throat> My problem with it is you think you're selling, and what you're doing is you're pushing your agenda. The minute you're pushing your agenda, people don't like it, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I should, is it Dan? Yes, Dan. If you don't mind, we'll just do a mini role play. But, but I'm a sales guy. Dan's a customer. I'm selling him a copier, all right? But this is how it goes. It's a very simple sale. So he's an owner of a business, Dan, Steve Herzog, XYZ Copiers. You know, we got the best copier in town. Are you familiar with us? We're XYZ. Have you ever heard of us? We're a great company. We do an awful lot. Your copier doesn't look like it's doing too well. How long do you have? Half a while. That's okay. Well, it's okay, but it's probably not working as well as it could. I mean, you don't have any problems with it. You're there. Well, we got a copier that's the best copier out there. Let me tell you, do you know what your cost of ownership is on that copier? It's a lot of money, isn't it? And what are you, what are you spending in cartridges, et cetera? Uh, well, we got, we got a product that's so much better, more efficient, et cetera. And you know what? You'll pay half the price on the ink, et cetera. <coughs> so what do you say we give it a try? I could bring a demo in here. We could work it out. And you know what? At the end of that, you could either buy it or not. Why? Come on. We're the best in town. And I'm pushing, pushing, pushing. And the more I push Dan, it's pushing the opposite way. Get out of here. That's the old way of selling. It's been around for decades and decades and decades. And by the way, do some salespeople make sales doing it that way? Yes, they do. Could they do better if they did it a different way? Yes, they would. Right? So rather than show up and push my agenda on Dan, I'm no longer going to do that. I want to understand his agenda, his interest in the copier, how it's working, asking questions, finding out information, and working to do the best job I can to be prospect-centered, not me-centered, not I-centered. All right, so we get a yes, we get a no. Listen, if you don't get a yes and you don't get a no, then you must get, well, here it is for what we call a clear future. I call it a clear future. A clear future, and I'll, and I'll give you our terminology and then I'll explain what it is. But our a clear future is this. If the guy says, I'm not buying, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to buy from you. I might, but not now. 
Call me in a week. This will happen, right? So you didn't get a yes and you didn't get a no. But you got it. Call me in a week. All right. I'll, I'll start to help you make money right now. Anytime anyone gives you wishy-washy futures and also uses wishy-washy words, don't accept them. Be nice, but don't accept them. So what does call me next week mean? What's that mean to you, Andy? What's call me next week mean to you? So when you, honestly, if we parted now, if we parted now, when do you think you might call me next week? What would you typically do? Monday afternoon. Monday afternoon. See, that's Andy's next week. Monday afternoon. That may not be my next week. My next week could be what? Friday. Could be, could be anything. Sounds unclear, doesn't it? So no longer accept call me next week. You might then say what? What time? What time? I don't know, afternoon. What, you know, what day of the week, what time is best for you? Uh, I don't know, Wednesday, I guess. Afternoon would be great. Is that clear now? We're all clear? We're not, are we? Well, why? Well, you didn't give you a specific time. I don't know. How do we do that? Yeah. I don't know. What time would be I'll good Monday or Wednesday or afternoon? Say, yeah, like 3 o'clock. I'll give you a call. 3 o'clock. Yeah, give me a call at 3 o'clock. So now he thinks he's good, right? He's got all the wishy-washy this out. We're now clear. So the average salesperson would leave and go, I've got a call next week, Wednesday at 3 o'clock. What do you think is going to happen when he calls at 3? Brian, the same thing. You think it's going to get him? I won't answer. I'll be different. He's going to get him. We know what he's like. So, so you, we've got to learn a process. By the way, these people will do this to put you off. And let's be real. If we're being put off and it's really no, let's just go for no. That's what we say in Sandler, go for no. You know, I'd be happy to call you back at 3 o'clock next week. Let's just pretend that I do that. Will you be here? Will you answer the phone? I might. <laughs> See, wishy-washy again. Listen, all of you, people are going to say to you, maybe, kind of, a little bit, pretty soon, possibly, I think, maybe, uh, tomorrow, tops consideration, looks good, very good, sounds good, really interested, that's all crap. So we got to get rid of that, and you've got to ask when they say those things what they mean by that. Don't accept wishy-washy words. Now, one way I teach this and train to help people is rather than to get rid of accepting wishy-washy words, what we need to do is we find a lot of times what you don't know in life, the way you are and the way you buy and the things you say affect how you sell. They're interlinked. Psychologically, you need to know the way you buy is the way you sell. All right, there's a direct connection. So guess what? You use a lot of wishy-washy words. You know, your wife says, uh, when are you coming home? Uh, pretty soon. And your wife accepts that? Okay, well, that's good. How long will she be accepting that for, right? But you're using them. So guess what happens when you use them? Someone gives them to you, you take them. So a good way to get rid of wishy-washy words and not take them is to not use them. Get them out of your vocabulary. Be, be succinct in your speech. Be succinct in your expectations, and you'd be amazed as that that will start to overflow in the way you sell. Don't, don't accept wishy-washy words. That's a rule, by the way. Rule number 117. <laughs> um, so, uh, back to the call me next week. What we want to do is get a clear future. What do we mean by a clear future? If you don't get a no and you don't get a yes, what you want to do is get a clear future, which is an appointment to meet with them again. And you would do that in addition to what we call an upfront contract. I don't expect you to know that, but the upfront contract is basically an agreement of what we'll be discussing when we get back together again in the second meeting, in this example. All right? So we have a clear future. So they say, call me next week. I'd be happy to. Let me ask you, we're meeting here today. Wouldn't it be better for us just to meet face to face? Now, they may accept that, they may not. You, where's the
the best place to sell? Let, let's test this out. So here we go. We got Facebook, we got LinkedIn, we got social media, we got uh, mail, we've got email, we've got fax, we've got phone call, we got uh, pigeon, and then we got face to face. If we had our brothers in the way we sell, where do you think in all of those is the best place to sell? Or if you will, allow people to buy? Where do you think it'd be? Okay, now that should be strong. I should be here, I mean, I should be blasting against these bricks. Because the best place to always sell is face to face. So if someone says to you, call me next week, what did we just learn? Face to face is the best place to sell. None of this call me next week. Now you gotta be nice, but I'd be happy to call you next week. Rather, would it make sense for us to get together and talk? Now, I'm 50% will accept me. 50% will say, no, 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 just call me. <coughs> well, you tell me. If you say that to a salesperson, I don't want to meet with you, just call me, what are you possibly saying? Oh. No. Yeah. So here we go, smells like no, let's defuse the bomb. So what's the bomb? To ask you a question, Dan, thanks for telling me you want to call me, you do not want to meet. Usually when I hear that, it means that you're just really not interested. You could just tell me that now, and we'll part friends. What do you want to say, Dan, in this role play? You can say anything. No. <laughs> no, you're not interested. No. So here we are now, you want me to call you, but it seems like you're just really not interested, so there'd be no reason to call you. Can I ask you a question? Sure. What caused us to get together to start today? Why did we even get together? I always bring the prospect back to what prompted them to have an interest to begin with. It's always a great way to go back. If something happened, what would you want to say? You can make it up, I guess. But I would be polite. I was being polite, so you weren't interested to begin with. You were never interested. It's okay, I just want to know that. Fair? Fair. Dan, we're done. There'd be no reason you'd want whatever it is I'm selling. It, it's over. And you were just being nice, you just wanted to meet with me, because you like people. It turns out, you probably don't like me too much. You certainly don't like what I have, service product, whatever it is. Fair? Fair. You're one of the most honest, open guys I've ever met, Dan. I want to say thank you. Yeah, I might as well stroke them. I can call it compliment. <laughs> I'm going to make them feel good. <laughs> so, so what could I now do? Well, let me ask you, Dan. You wouldn't know anyone else I should be in front of. I mean, it's not going to work out for you, but is there anyone else I should be talking to? You know, any associations you might belong to? And maybe you'd know people like you who could use my product or service or whatever. I'd ask for a referral. You see what you all forget? And we all do this. I mean, I used to do it too. When we get no's, you don't ask for referrals. That's the best place to be asking for referrals. Learn this. Every, every time you're with someone, whether you get their business or you don't, ask for a referral. You'd be surprised. Half the population out there that told you no feels bad. So I give them a referral. I'll make them feel better and I'll feel better because I gave them something. I didn't buy from them, but I gave them something. You'd be amazed the number of salespeople who miss that. And they get a no and they walk away. Does anyone, I, I hate to bring this up and I know we've got time to go in here. Is anyone in the heating and air business? That's good. Guess who just had to buy a whole new heating and air unit? <laughs> Guess who had to get those salespeople? Yeah. Would you like to sell to me? Yeah. I'm driving a car, you know, test driving a car. So what do you do for a living? <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> don't want to know. All right. So let's do this. Let's get yeses, let's get noes. Let's learn if we don't get a no or a yes or a clear future, then we get a lesson because you screwed up. That's the bottom line, all right? Mm. <clears throat> all right. What I want to talk about is the prospect system, the buyer's system. Um, they have a process that they go through. You all have a process you go through when you buy. 
So let's do this. Um, I, I am decreeing all of you buyers, because you buy things, Andy, you buy things, right? Okay. Andy buys things. You're all buyers. And let's just say, let's just say for simplicity, uh, you met with a good friend of yours three weeks ago, and you were talking about life insurance, and that maybe you need to check up. Does anyone sell life insurance here? Andy does. No? Well, you don't. No. And you don't want to. Uh, there we go. A few people sell life insurance. Okay. I'm not picking on you all. I'm just using it as a typical example, so I just want you to know. Um, so your best friend you met with uh, three weeks ago, you were talking about life insurance and maybe kind of what you need to reevaluate. So you're doing that. Uh, your best friend ends up meeting with a life insurance agent and buys life insurance. And guess what that life insurance agent does? Because they're very well trained and they're very good. The prior slide. Get it, maybe it won't. Oop, there it is. They ask for a referral. So um, the life insurance salesman makes the sale, asks for a referral, and guess who the referral was? You. Okay. The life insurance agent calls you up. <coughs> let's just say they get you. Let's just say. And let's just say you're somewhat interested. Now you're not gonna like buy. But you're somewhat interested, you kind of want to recalibrate, just want to see where you are. Maybe you need some, maybe you don't. So you accept an appointment with that life insurance agent. Okay. You set it for, oh, let's pick a good time. Saturday afternoon, 4 p.m. You're a busy guy. You, you don't have time during the week. So, okay, let's be honest here and let's just walk through this. So uh, it's about 5 to 4 on a Saturday afternoon. You realize I booked this appointment with this life insurance salesperson. How are you feeling? Excited? <laughs> huh. Okay. So they pull up, they knock on the door, you kind of peek out, oh gosh. What do you think and feel and be honest with me? Just yell it out. What do you think and feel like? Be honest. I'm going to kill myself. How soon can I get rid of them? What else? I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about my death. What else? You want to open the door. Don't want to open the door. Let's pretend no one's home. <laughs> I mean, and this is not unusual at all. So we go through this, and this is your general feeling. By the way, it's the feeling of 80, 90% of most people. They'd just rather not be doing this. I mean, I'd rather go to the dentist. You know, I just don't really want to do this. Um, they come in, they shake your hand, and in the first two minutes, you tell them everything on your mind. Do you do that, Jay? Do you tell them everything that's on your mind, why you're, what you're hoping for? Do you share, Brian, what's on your mind? You're open to them? So everyone in this room is open to sharing with them everything that's on their mind, what well, you're not. No, 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 no. You're silent. <clears throat> What can? Let them talk. Let's see what they got. Let's see how good they are. Let's see what they know. Those are typical kinds of things that an average prospect would be thinking of. I wonder how much this costs. I wonder if they're any good. I wonder if they're going to push something on me. I mean, these are all natural things we might be thinking. I'm not trying to plan them, but we might think of these things, right? <clears throat> okay. So, by the way, most people are going to be totally open in the very beginning of sharing all that's on their mind, most people, some will, some take What's that, Jay? Just related to the business at hand. Oh, at the business at hand, okay. So um, what we find is people generally hold back, right? They hold back, they don't share everything. We have a term for this, it's called mislead. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> uh, All right. So we have a mislead. Sometimes they may even do worse than mislead. Have any of you ever done worse than mislead to a salesperson? You can be honest here. It's okay. Ma'am, in the very back, orange shirt. Is it orange, red? Forgive me. Coral. Coral. Of course. <laughs> of course. I should know. Of course. Forgive me. Your name? Lindsay. Lindsay. Thank you. Have you ever done that to a salesperson? To a salesperson? Yeah, between you and me. Yeah. Definitely. That's nice of you to share that. 
amongst all the eternity. <laughs> Lindsay, how did it make you feel when you did that? I mean, how did you handle the sleepless nights, the throwing up blood, <laughs> the, the anguish of many days of having done that? How did you handle that guilt? I survived. You look like you did. <laughs> she did. So what we find is interesting is know that step one of a prospect system or a buyer system, when I first meet you as a stranger, or of course if you meet a salesperson for the first time as a stranger, I'm going to be holding back a little bit. To whatever degree depends on the individual. But I'm not gonna share everything on my mind. You need to know as a sales professional, people who get together with you for the first time who don't know you will be doing that, more than likely, to some degree, okay? It's okay. By the way, when you do this to this life insurance salesman, does that make you a bad person, Brian? It doesn't make you a bad person. Are you a bad person? I don't think you're going to seem like a bad person to me. So my point is here, they're not bad people, but what happens is, is they just don't know you. And it's human nature for them to hold back. <coughs> and they may even do worse. They may lie. Okay? But it's okay. They're not bad people. So what happens now, again, you all are buyers in this life insurance. Who knows more about life insurance than this example I've got? You or the salesperson, the life insurance sales? Who knows more about life insurance? Probably the salesperson. Fair. Good. Okay, so if you were someone interested in life insurance, what would you probably be doing with that salesperson? Ask a lot of questions. You would. Who said that? Good job. Ask a lot of questions. And what would that salesperson more than likely do? Answer them. Who said that? Very good, Dan. Good. So they answer them. And when they answer them, what do we know about salespeople who really know their stuff? What do they do when they answer? Talk a lot. Talk a lot. Who said that? Very good. They talk a lot because they're very knowledgeable. Very knowledgeable. You know, good question between universal life and term. Let me tell you a little bit about why you might want to look at term versus universal life. Not a lot of people do. Let me explain what I mean by that. Bob, I need to get it off. Five, ten minutes go by, and I answer it in space. You got any more questions? <laughs> right? Salesperson then answers those questions, etc. Okay? So this is the way it's going. Let's just say the salesperson asks a few more questions of you, and they leave, and they're going to come back to meet with you and your significant other, spouse, wife, husband, because they don't want a one-legger. They want, they want they come, both people there. They come back in that second meeting. What do you think they usually come back with? Application. Okay, they'll come back with a contract application. Before they do that, what do they need to now provide? Who said that? Proposal. They got, to send, they got to provide a proposal. So here it is. Beautiful proposal. Three ring bound. It's in color, not black and white, Heather. We're going to make this special for you. And, and Heather, notice we have you on the pit, a little picture. With, do you have a dog, cat, Heather? <laughs> we put that on there if you have one. And it, it, very pretty. And, and it's got some weight to it. You know, it's got, it looks good. It's very nice. Let me tell you a little bit about what we have here for you today. And I'll walk you through. Now, we're going to provide this proposal. So they listen because they're somewhat interested. You tell them all about exactly what they need and if it's for them and da 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 And what do I really probably care as the buyer, as the buyer here, what you really care about? Price. Price. Good. So you're waiting, waiting, waiting for them to go through all the stuff, and on the very last page, the very bottom, et cetera, is the price, premium in this case. So you go, oh, wow, that's more than I wanted, I don't know, and they say, well, you know, if you sign this agreement, press hard twice, the second copy is yours, we can move forward, get you covered today, da 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 da, da right? And then you say, sir, I forgot your name. Drew. Drew. And then you say, what, Drew? Press hard here, we'll get you going, get your family covered, etc. You say, I'm going to need to look it over. Thanks, Drew. Um, 
All right, well, how long are you going to look it over for? A couple days. A couple days. Okay, a couple days makes sense. Uh, should I call you in a couple days? So here we go. You know, say here. Come on. Yeah, you can call me. Yeah, sure, call me. Oh, I'm not going to answer the phone. <laughs> call me. Happy to. Okay, so I leave. I'm Mr. Salesman. I think I'm doing a good job. And uh, you know what? I come back to the office. The boss says, how'd it go? Great. He said to give him a call in a couple of days. I think we're really good, boss. We got this one in the bag. <laughs> it's coming. And you know what? I got 50 more like them. This is going to be great. I mean, when these things pop in, I'm going to be in room. I'm going to be in the riches, baby. I'm talking new car. This is going to be fantastic. 50 of these you've got. You know what you got? Nothing. You got nothing. Okay, so let's just go through. And I'm not picking on you, Drew. You're okay. I'm not hurting you. No, I'm good. <laughs> All right. So, Drew says I'm going to look at it for a couple of days. Let's even say that he's possibly still interested. So if you are, Drew, what are you going to do? I am. I'm actually going to look it over. You're going to look it over? Anything else you might do with that information I left you, Drew? I throw it on the counter and let it get covered up by it. Oh, well, forget about it. Maybe that's what I do. I bury my head in the sand when I make decisions and hope something happens. That's a way. If you were somewhat really interested in buying, what might you do? Cost comparison. Yeah. Do what? Cost comparison. A cost comparison. How would you do that? Go to your agent. An agent? You're Go online? online? You can do all those things. So Drew, if you were someone interested, you might do that, right? Yep. So let me get this right. You called me in, you took one meeting from me, you jacked me around for that meeting, I came back the second meeting, gave you my proposal, my knowledge, my information, and my premium. You said come back another day, and now you're taking the information I gave you and you're using it against me. Are you doing that, Drew? <laughs> Drew, when you do that, you feel guilty, you throw up blood, and you're very poor couple. Do you? Yeah. Well, I'm certain, right? That's an easy business. I mean, you, this never happens to you. These proposals, you don't do them. I don't. But they never think it over, and you don't think they compare if you've left your information. That doesn't happen, does it? I'm sorry? It does. How does it feel? Normal. <laughs> <laughs> so it's happened to me so much, punch me in the face. I'm used to it. Punch me more. There's got to be a better way. All right. So what happens is you put me off in the beginning. Maybe you do worse and you lie. The second step, by the way, when you collected my proposal, my information, my knowledge, is <coughs> you stole my information and knowledge. Another term we use is you, you took unpaid consulting from me. Has anyone ever had that happen? You provide your knowledge? I, I will be honest, raise your hand. Have you ever provided a solution to a customer and they went somewhere else? That doesn't happen in banking. <coughs> right. Doesn't happen, I know it doesn't happen in insurance. <coughs> Why are we in this business? Why don't we just become post then or something? Or post people. Let's just. Why are we doing this to ourselves? All right. So, Miss Lee, take information, put it on paid consulting, put me off again. Drew, that's what you did to me. You said call me in two days. But did he ever have any intention of me really? Uh, or, or did he really have any intention to talk to me? Probably not. So he probably lied to me again. Have, have you ever done this? Sir, you, you look like you got it together. <laughs> not really. So, <laughs> so have you ever had a situation where you may have put a salesperson off on a decision and have no intention of buying from them? Yeah. But now, one last time, you don't suffer the guilt that you're doing. <laughs> you don't. Here we go, it's kind of sad. And then, <laughs> that's pretty 
funny, isn't it? <laughs> well, well, has this happened to you? Sure. You like it? <laughs> There's got to be a better way here. There's got to be a better way. They steal your information, they steal your knowledge, they steal your pricing, and then they go somewhere else. Now, here's a good question for you and a rule. So whose fault is it that this happened? Whose fault? Someone said it. Mine. Mine. Oh, you take it to the darn thing. It is your fault. It's all your fault. You did it. You did it. Now, you did it because you didn't know any better. You didn't know another way. So we got to find another way. And that's honestly where we're going here. What we're hoping to do is helping you on some of these things on the board is we got to have a system. We're already sold on the fact we need that. But wouldn't it be cool if we had a system to combat this thing called the prospect system? Because I assure you, every time you get in front of a prospect, and you all more or less have agreed that you do this to some extent, you're going to get this every time to various levels. So we need to accept the fact if you take anything out of today, think about this. Every time you get in front of a prospect, they're going to do this. They're going to hold back. They're going to try to get on paid consulting. You know, geez, Heather, what would you recommend I do in this situation? Da 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 da. Heather knows she's been in banking forever. You know what Heather's going to say? Well, what I would do is da 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 <laughs> yeah. I think I might have just stay with who I got, but it was so nice to see you. And if I ever change bands, I, I'm going to call you. I assure you, you're at the top of the list. But here's another rule for you. When a prospect starts giving you compliments, like, you're a lovely person, Heather. Really <laughs> love meeting you. What a nice meeting. You're such a good person. You seem like such a great guy. Guess what? You're getting no. They're prepping you for the no. So be careful. Be wary. We say in sales, if someone's being real nice to you, and by the way, that's what the people really like to do with unpaid consulting when they extract it. Gosh, Drew, you seem like such a good guy and you're so knowledgeable. Could you tell me more about that? <laughs> I'm like really interested. A really interested prospect is no prospect at all. That's a rule. That's a rule. You better have your guard up. They're going to suck you dry. And you're going to give it to them because you think you're helping them. And you are to buy something else from someone else. Not you. You're helping them. I'm all upset. What kind of music? It's what? 1240. I think my watch stopped. Okay. David Sandler, who started Sandler back 40 plus years ago, 45 years ago, he's a very nice man. And uh, kind of interesting if you want to know, he's out of Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, uh, the, the short story, if you want to hear it, he was in the cookie and cracker business with his father. Uh, back in the 60s, uh, cookie and cracker business, the mom and pops were being bought out by Nabisco and all these big conglomerates. So they got bought out by a big conglomerate. <coughs> David's father passed away, and David went on a sailing trip for two weeks or something and came back. And the company that he still had ownership in, but not whole ownership, changed the locks on the doors and basically wouldn't let him in. Long story short, legal battle, blah, blah, blah. He's out, and they've now taken over the whole business, contractually, blah, blah, blah. So David's got no business, uh, <coughs> some money, but he's young and he wants to do something, and he wants to help sales. It seems to be in his heart. Long story short, he goes to work for a company called Motivation Inc. out of Waco, Texas. They're still a, still a company today. And uh, what he does is uh, sells motivational records. And he goes door to door to businesses with this big box of records. That's what they had back then. Okay? <laughs> but, you know what I'm saying? No, it's okay. Shouldn't feel bad. All right. So uh, he goes and these people say things like, 
Call me next week. Uh, leave the records with me. Let me listen to a few. If they're any good, I'll buy them from you. All these things, and guess what happens? He comes back, and they listen to him, and they go, it's not any good. I don't want to buy it. But in fact, they took copious notes off the record, and they started using his stuff on paid consulting. You see the picture. So David's like really upset with the way he's being treated as a salesman. And he happens to be at a, I guess it was a bar, and he's meeting with his good friend who happens to be a psychiatrist. And he says, you know, what is it with people? They say, come back next week, and you come back the next week, and they don't want to see it. Why do they do that? Why, do they, why don't they just be honest with you and say, I'm not interested? But yet they just tell you, come back or call me or whatever, but really it's, they're not interested. Why do people do that? And a psychiatrist, as he went through this, had a reason for everything the human did in terms of responding to David as a, as a salesman. And he started to realize truly what happened is we all grew up in selling in a traditional manner and what we've really forgotten is that the traditional way of selling, which is push your product or service on someone until they say give up and they buy, or they don't, um, is a way, but psychologically it's the poorest way of selling. Because, and the psychologist explained to David, now this is, this is one of our complex techniques, and I, and I do mean it, but I want you to get thinking about this because it's very, very powerful. So, Brian, you mind standing up, sir? You're a pretty stout guy, right? Okay. So if I were to, if I'm pushing Brian, what you didn't know, and I didn't say anything, good job. No offense. <laughs> when I pushed him, at about the third push, he started pushing back. Naturally. I never told him to do that, but he did that. He did that instinctively. Instinctively. So let's think about this. When the average traditional salesperson goes in to sell their product or service, what are they trying to get that prospect to say? I'll buy. Or yes. Or where do I go? So the salesperson's pushing them to say, yes, I want to buy. What do you think instinctively someone who's being pushed to buy is going to do? No, I don't want to buy. No, I'm not interested. No, I don't want to buy from you. They will instinctively push the opposite way. Take this to the bank, it's true. People buy when they're pushed in a manner that they need to realize they're going to go the opposite way. I didn't say that right. Let me restate it. I got lost here. People instinctively are going to push in the opposite manner a salesperson is going to push them. If you're showing up and you want someone to buy, they're going to say no. More or less. Boil it all down. Buy from me, buy from me because of this, because of that. I've got the best thing since sliced bread. We're the good, we're best service, got quality, all these things. You've got to buy from me. They're sitting there, what you don't know, is saying, no, I don't, and I don't think you're the best quality. And you know what? I don't know if you're in the best service. They're instinctively going the opposite way you're pushing them. So, we can continue to do that, and I was like beating our head against the wall, or do the opposite. What's the opposite? Instinctively knowing they're going to push back, we're going to push the opposite way. You're probably not interested in what I have. There's no value in what I have. There's no reason you'd want to meet with me. Um, I don't see why you'd want to buy from me. You know what'll happen? They'll start to go, no, no, there is a reason. No, no, the reason I met with you today is da 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 da. They will push back. They won't even know that they're doing it. This is high level psychology that we teach. It's one example. The reason I bring it up is because the psychologist started to share with David the human basis of how people process and how people buy. And people buy in spite of the salesperson, and when the salesperson is pushing their agenda, versus the salesperson who's smart enough to realize what I really need to do is get them to discover why they need to buy from me. Okay? They need to discover why. So, and if you don't mind, you mind if I pick on lawns? So, you know, 
so, so you come out, you're going to estimate a lawn, I don't know, fertilize, cut kind of thing, is that what you do? Cut, fertilize, right? Pretty easy. Pretty easy, straightforward, right? So, this is what happens. This is what happens. And I'm not picking on you, any lawn company. They'll show up, da 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 let me measure out what we got, da 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 see what it's going to cost. I mean, did you have a budget for this? You might ask a few questions. I mean, have you had any particular problems with your own, whatever it might be? Okay. The bottom line is, they're going to then say, okay, well, this is what we quote fertilization, cutting the lawn, da 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 every two weeks, blah, blah, blah. If it rains more, it might be like that, or whatever, okay? And I'll sit there and go, okay, well, let me think about it. You know, just give me a call next week, typical, right? So what happens here? is that whole dynamic you meant well, but you never engaged the prospect. So this is these are examples of what I'm saying in the opposite. Alright? I want you to go to someone and you're looking at their lawn and it's the stinking crappiest lawn you've ever seen. Let's say. Let's just say it's really crappy, right? I want you to say, I want you to show up and do this. Nice looking lawn. Looks great. <laughs> this is gold. What are they going to say? Brian, what are they going to say? They're going to say, what's wrong with it? Or you're done. Yeah, yeah. looks bad. <laughs> don't need your services. Let's be real, honestly. You know, this one's not that bad. It really looks pretty good. I'm going to say this as, a, as, your, as the lawn butler. That's what I'm going to say. What would the average, be honest, what would the average person say? Now, is that good for me or bad for me? Are you crazy? It looks terrible. That's what most people are going to say. Now, is he going right down my system, my way? Perfect. And he is. Well, what do you mean it looks terrible? And then you'd say? See all the dead grass over there? Fair point. I, I didn't see that. But that doesn't happen every year. You'd say? Uh, it's been like that for years. I'm sorry, what? For years. I go hard of hearing. I make them say it twice. It's to my benefit. It's all selling. It's gold. He's selling himself on this. I don't need to sell Butler lawn. So let, let me ask you. I mean, if that's not a big deal for you, fair. I mean, so you got some bad grass or bad grass. That's not a big deal. Oh, it's huge. When we come out, the family's out here. Why is that bad, though? It's embarrassing. Four? Nice <laughs> lawn. Nice lawn. But it doesn't, it looks maybe a little bit of yours. You're crazy. What do you mean I'm crazy? My lawn looks like crap compared to his. <laughs> now, is that good for me in selling or bad? It's good yeah. for me. This is perfect. And he's selling himself. I haven't even told him what I do yet. He's starting to go, wow, this guy, he's good. Honest to God, they'll start to sit there and discover, wow, this is really, this guy can help me. So how do you find that line between selling, them selling themselves and you looking confident? Okay. Yeah, fair point. Outdoors. And these are fair. That's a fair question. I'm giving you a sliver of a of a concept, and now we could walk away and we could use this concept wrong. And I believe me, what I'm sharing with you, it could use wrong, be used wrong. The concept is called. And I'll answer your question. We call this negative reverse selling. All right. This is the bottom line, though. Negative reverse selling is like nuclear rocket fuel. If you use it right, it's very powerful. If it's used or handled incorrectly, it will blow up. And that's, that's his point. And it's a fair point. So how do you get them to like you and be interested in what you got without sounding stupid or like you're an idiot, right? And that's, a, that's something you just practice. It takes time. That's why our, our training isn't you know, one-day training. It's, it's an hour and a half a week for three years because we condition you to get better, better, better. It's like going to the gym, you know, better, 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 better. So to your point, this concept, you walk away from here, you go use it. I just, warning, asterisks, if handled incorrectly, it'll blow up. They'll look at you and go, are you some kind of an idiot? They will, but you didn't do it right. You didn't do it the right way. You didn't watch tone. You didn't watch way the way you said it. You didn't watch when you should have said it. So there's a lot of interplay there. So to answer your question, practice get you to be the pro rather than the idiot, if you will. I know that's not what you really wanted to hear, but it's the truth. Take practice. Practice, practice, practice. We practice a lot. Today's training, my advanced president's club training this morning, we did role play. There are some people in that class that want to throw up like crazy.
crazy and role play, but it gets you better, better, better. And we're always sharpening the sword, sharpening, sharpening. So, anyway. Questions so far? I feel like I'm not a director here. Does this, does this make sense, any of it? Mm -hmm. All right. What I want to do is just go through some of the steps in our selling process. David Sandler developed this. He did it in concert with a psychologist. And we said, boy, we got to figure out a way to address this buyer system or prospect system. Because they're going to mislead. They're going to take unpaid consulting from us. They're going to mislead us again. And they're going to cause us to be in chase mode. And chase, 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 and follow up. We can't have that. So we developed a seven-step system. We used the submarine to do it. Because in the old days, <coughs> when you remember the good submarine movies, that, that, that the blowing up and the hatch, and they turn down the hatch, it's kind of the process here. Because there's seven hatches, seven compartments. Um, so bonding and rapport, all things being equal, people do business with people they trust. All things not being equal, people do business with those they trust. So what's this tell you? The whole basis of how people buy from you truly, truly is all, 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 all boiled down to can I trust you? Can I trust you? That's all it is. Can I trust you're going to do a good job for me? Can I trust you're not going to just, you know, put uh, chemicals down that, that are weak and, you know, inappropriate and save you money and cut costs and don't give me the green one I want? You know, how do I know you're going to show up on time? How can I trust you? I'm paying you all this money. You know, it's not nasty, but these are how, this is how people think. They, they've got to trust you. So, that is the biggest thing. We've got to work on getting them to trust. The number one thing you need to do, the first step in our selling process, is learn how to bond and rapport with people. But not the old way. The sale fish on the wall is an example. The old way. So you walk into a person's office and you see a sale fish on the wall. What's the standard traditional salesperson do? Nice fish. Nice fish! You deep sea fish? <laughs> yeah, I do. Really, where do you go? Blah, blah, blah. Old. Old. People see this. In fact, when you're a buyer, you see some of this. Because back to that insurance, if I'm in your house, what do I say about your house when I walk in? Nice. Nice house. Do you get a sense that maybe that's a little bit transparent? <laughs> Sir, do you have children? Yes. Those are lovely children. And you've got pictures of them up on your mantle, and that life insurance comes, salesman comes in, and he says, what? Nice looking family. Now, they could look like monkeys. <laughs> Good. It's transparent. This is old. So in Sandler, we say, stop doing what everyone else is doing, the old stuff, and bonding and rapport, and trying to find common ground, finding golf clubs in the corner and saying, what's your handicap? Get rid of all that. It's all old. People don't, they see through that these days. So our bonding and rapport is going to be building trust and we're going to use psychology to do so. Um, rules, no mutual mystification. Let me see if I can go forward here. Prospects buy for their reasons, not the salesperson's reasons. People buy emotionally. They make decisions intellectually. These are all rules that we have. But Allow me to go back. Um, I was looking for a certain slide that didn't come up. Um, we want to bond and report it. Let me just give you an example of things we developed based on pure human psychology. This is proven psychology. You can take this to the bank. It's been around for decades. But it's the first time it's really been applied to selling. <clears throat> we... Uh, We call this the communication pie. It's been around in human psychology for the long, longest time. There are three ways we all communicate. Just three ways, real simple. We, we communicate physiologically. We communicate via tone, tonality. And we communicate based on word content. Okay? 55% of communication is physiological, 38% is tone, and 7% is word content. This is 
Take it to the bank researchers. 55% <coughs> is physiology. So the findings of the study is that people communicate more based on the way you look than anything else you say or do. But it's the way you look. Okay? That being the case, we want to become much more aware when we're bonding and rapport with people to do something that makes them more comfortable, right? We want them comfortable. So we're going to learn to match and mirror their physiology. Proven, proven science says that people like people who are like them. The more like your prospect you are, the more they will like you. Lots of likes. Idea. Okay, so some of you are in situations in selling where maybe you're always standing, but be aware of your stance. You want to match and mirror the prospect stance. A lot of you probably are in a, a business where you may be across the desk or in a conference room, etc. Be aware of your physiology, and what do I mean by that? Is be very aware of how you're dealing with them. If I'm meeting with Dan in an example, and Dan's sitting exactly the way he is. And I come in, and there are salespeople who do this. They don't know they're doing it. Dan, let me tell you a little bit about Sandler training, who we are. I'll ask you some questions. I want to know more about what's going on in your world. Now, subconsciously, Dan's sitting there going, I don't like this guy. He's bugging me. It's something about him. It's all subconscious, by the way. This is You don't even do this consciously. But I'm telling you, Dan is not feeling me, baby. He's not. But... If I do this, <clears throat> Dan, if I could tell you a little bit about Sandler training, maybe ask some questions, et cetera, and more about what you're Physiologically, I'm, I'm very similar. I'm leaning a little bit forward. My feet are apart like his. My hands are up here and available. I want to be very similar to him. Not to be exactly like him, but you'd be amazed. It starts to build bonding and rapport, and we're not even thinking about it, nor are they. Just very simple. So, and then Dan moves. You know, he just in his chair, he sits back, he crosses his legs or whatever, I would then move. They're about 30 seconds later, but we teach this, this is important, towards bonding and rapport. These are the things you want to be working on, not sailfish on the wall. Tonality, 38% of communication is tonality. Here we go. Let's see. Eric, you seem to be very attentive and listening. Are you kind of your mom? I noticed you don't have a wedding ring. I was going to ask, are you married? No. For a reason. No. <laughs> no. That's a joke. I get it. No. That's a joke. No. Uh, sir, are you married? Yes, sir. You are. And your wife's name is? Tafan. 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 Nice name. Tafan. So you're leaving the house in the morning, and you say, Tafan, where are my car keys? You might get a certain response. Hear snore. She's still asleep. <laughs> How's that? Mean? <laughs> Same way it's felt for 28 years. Everyone's <laughs> <laughs> got their own life. <laughs> and if she happened to be aware, or he could say, "To find a word on my car keys," you get a whole different response. So you know this. If you're ch you children, you know the wise Alex, smart ass. Forget my language. Smart Alec, I meant to say. Child who sasses back, right? And it's not what they said, but it's the way they said it. It's the way they said it. A lot of us respond based on tone more than you know. So we want to be very cognizant of tone. And what we teach in our training is to learn to match and mirror their tonality. Now, not to get too deep into things. <clears throat> How much more time do I have? Oh, you got all day. You're done. Ten minutes? So how much after one? It's what? Two minutes after one. Two minutes after one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of the office right now, so keep going. Keep going. Okay, five areas of tonality. Resonance, pitch, pace, re uh, rhythm, I 
resonance, pitch, pace, rhythm. Uh, <coughs> it's an easy one. Oh, fine. So we want to match and mirror all aspects of tonality. It's the best thing you can do out of the shoot in bonding rapport with people is be liquid. You've all found situations like this. You've been in front of someone and you're talking about this and you say, I invite you here, Jim, and talk to you a little bit about, you know, what we do, et cetera. And there might be a prospect who talk like this, or people who should. <laughs> now, Andy, do you think you coming in going, yeah, you know what, uh, let me tell you a little bit about what we do. You know, white insurance and how we help out people. You're going to do that? That's not good body and rapport, Andy. So what are you doing? Andy? You want to be like a prospect. I'm so glad you asked that. Thanks a lot. I talk like this all the time. It's funny that you do too. <laughs> there are people who talk in rhythms. Uh, I use uh, President Obama. The way he talks, if you listen, this is very important. These things all play. He talks chop, and he talks some more. He talks chop. That's how he talks. So if you get in front of someone who talks like that, that's what you need to do, Drew. <laughs> Talk like that. Yeah. 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 And by the way, subconsciously bonding and rapport, they're going to like you more. And by the way, if they're going to like you, that's a better chance of you being able to sell with them. I'm not saying we're into the trust area yet, but we're getting there. Okay? I mean, it takes a lot of time to get trust. All right. So what we're learning from this is that if we do physiology and match and mirror them well and tonality, that represents a great majority of how people communicate, and that's where you want to focus more than anything. And in sales, it's funny, in my old world in corporate America, I used to think the things I didn't say or things I did say affected the sale, when in fact, in reality, it had little to do with the sale. It had more to do with how did I look when I was in front of them and how did I sound when I was in front of them. It had a lot more to do with it, not what I said. So when you start to realize this, you start, wow, you know, there's a lot of things um, that we've got to be looking at. I don't know how that got up there, but no money, no sale. That's budget. That's a budget issue. But mm -hmm. um, there are times when people don't have money. If they don't have money, then there's no sale. I mean, you get move on. I mean, there are some people who kick tires with you. Do you know there's some people out there that are lonely? Yeah, come on by, Brian. Come on by. <laughs> and you're sitting there an hour later going, well, what the heck did I get in front of? They're not buying anything. They have no intention of buying anything. Well, there are some people out there that have, say they have no the money and they really do. Those that say they have the money and then they really do? Yeah. I will tell you this. Someone who says this, there you go. You've heard this, here it goes. Money's not an option, Heather. Not an option. It's going to be the biggest problem you're going to have. Take it to the bank. Don't worry about money. Money's, don't worry about that. If I hear that, it's like, shit. It's going to be the biggest issue. People are funny. People are funny. Listen, I'm sorry I ran over. Um, let me see what I can do here. We're going to go through my rules. You don't want to do all those rules. All right. Fly out a system. I lost it behind the sales. Uh, this is the pendulum. This is negative reverse selling I was talking about early. earlier. It's kind of, this is the concept of what we teach using it as a pendulum. If people are super positive about you and they want to buy, they're your worst prospect. You better be on guard because you're right about to lose the sale. You've never been there, right? Had a great meeting. We got along. He loved me. I loved him. Oh, it was so good. Nothing. No sale. And he goes, what the heck happened? What happened is they were very positive, but you left them. If this is a pendulum and it swings, where do they have to go if they're really positive? Down. Over here. Back to neutral or disinterested. Be very wary of someone you leave a meeting in that's very positive and it's a great meeting. Guess what's going to happen? It's not going to be so great the next time you talk to them. They're moving down. The reverse, when you get in front of people that, that don't want to meet with you, that are antagonistic, believe it or not, I know this is all counterintuitive, but I swear to you, I've done this enough and I've seen it enough. They're your best prospect. 
So the next time the guy says, by the way, let's talk a little bit about this because I do want to do it. The big one, I'm happy. All right. First of all, if someone says I'm happy, more than likely it's a protection mechanism against what they've been exposed to in bad salespeople. It's their protection mechanism. I'm happy. Is it possible when you've ever bought something, you told the salesperson you were happy, but you really weren't? Fair? Does that not happen sometimes? So people who say they're happy may not really mean it, but they're doing it to protect themselves. So what you do with really happy people is get them to convince you how happy they are. That's the goal. So I'm happy. I'm so happy that you're happy. So it sounds like there'd be no reason for us to even talk further. This could be a very short meeting. We could finish our coffee and go. Because there's nothing I could do for you. Not a thing. Now, if I were a bank, I might say, sounds like, let me just go through this and we'll be real quick about it. But you feel like you're getting the level of service you need from your current bank. You feel like you're being handled in a civilized manner and they're getting back to you when you have problems and challenges. The online system is working. You're not having any issues there. When you need help with regard to lines of credit or whatever, you're getting those. And it sounds like all your mortgage rates are in order and you really don't have a problem there. Fair. And they go, yep, 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 yep. Let's just say they say yep to all that. Okay. Well, then what do I do? If I'm a pro, I've got another four I throw out. What else could there be? Another, I don't know. If you're a bank. Uh, would, you, uh, would you call the office to fill it in? Or do you get it yeah. Or you have to call Birmingham, you know, or, you know, whatever. You know, is it important that you talk to someone local in a bank? You know, they might then say, well, yeah, you know, I mean, that could be better. And then you just stop. You're, you're starting now. Well, how can it be better? And now you're going down what's called the pain funnel. Now you're going down to find something. So what we want to try to do is help people, but we've got to get them to discover what their issues are. When they say they're happy, we just need more confirmation of what they mean by happy. And load them up. You're, you're happy here, you're happy there, you're happy here, you're happy there, you're happy, 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 happy. I mean, there's no area that you're unhappy. What do people have a tendency to say? There's, listen. Ron, right? Yes, sir. Ron, here we go, watch this. This is how it works. This is how it works with every product or service. Ron, uh, just generally, but this is, we're, we're talking generally. You're happy with your life. You're happy with your finances. You're happy with your mortgage. You're happy with your work. You're happy with the results of your work. You're happy with the way things are going with your wife and your children. Fair? Yes. In all those matters. There, in other words, there wouldn't be one area where you're not happy. Listen to this. I'm about to close the door. Ron, you gonna let me close it? What are you gonna say? Put it on. I'm sorry? I said there's always other things that can make me happy. Oh, really? I am so surprised he said that. If he's being somewhat honest with me, he's going to say that. So when you when you say that, what rhyme could be better? Time off. More time off. Now, I'm not saying I can fix that. I don't even know. But uh, my point is, I want you to see the visualization of what's going on there. When you push someone to say that they're happy in all accounts, what will generally happen? They're not happy in all accounts. And then they'll pick something. Usually people do. Not always, though. So Brian's going to leave here. He's going to go out there and say, your lawn's good. You're happy with your lawn. You like your lawn. You like mowing it. You're happy. Yes. Now, what, where's that horizontal? What, what, what do I do now? That, that really worked good. <laughs> right? So sometimes you'll be caught flat-footed, by the way, and they'll agree to everything that they are happy. And you don't have anything else to give. It's over. Move on. Go find another lawn. Go find another homeowner. You should be going to every home next to them and across the street, religiously. If you didn't get a sale, you didn't get a sale. Next door, across the street. Next door, across the street. Always. You'll get more sales. I didn't finish all of what I wanted to talk about. And I'm sorry for that. I talk too much. All right, let's just see. And you want to go ah, Imagine that. Imagine that. I hope this helped a little. Uh, did I address everything? So how many people open up, by the way, is to ask questions? 
and understand their world. That's how you get them to open up. Thirty-second commercial. What do I say? In your thirty-second commercial, what do you say? It's more important. What are typical problems and challenges people have, and you'll want to plant those typical problems and challenges. See, let me explain. Someone says to me, so, I'll make a cold call, right? Cold call, <coughs> ring, 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 Mo says hello. I say, hi, Mo. Stephen Herzog, Sandler training, you probably never heard of me or my company, you might say. Oh, yes, I have. Oh, great, what have you heard? Blah, 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 blah. blah. Okay, thanks, Mo. Let me tell you why I'm calling you. I won't take a lot of your time. Do you mind if I just add, to spend the next two minutes, ask you a few questions. At the end of the call, you can choose to hang up or we can continue talking. Sure. Thanks. Typically, I work with a lot of businesses. Sometimes they find themselves frustrated with the fact that they're not closing enough sales. Other times they're angry about the fact that they've got salespeople that come and go and they're not sure why. Sometimes they've got a lot of follow-up files of business pending, but they don't know how to close it. Or other times they're just plain, you know, just wrung out because they've got less profitability, lower margins. I don't suppose any of those are challenges for you, Mo. Are they in your business? Of course they are. Of course they are. Not, I mean, one of them, right? Not all of them. <laughs> yes, all of them, as you might say. All right. Um, so my, my point is, what I'm trying to give you there at the vignette is this. Notice what I did. I did not say this. Mo, Sandler Training, Steve Herzog. We're a sales training company, and what we do is we train salespeople. We give them a system to sell. We've got a submarine and seven compartments to the sale, and what we do is we walk you through so you learn about those seven compartments and you just in selling every day. I'm just wondering, what looks good for you, next Tuesday or Wednesday? Sorry. That's crap. My point is all of you well-meaning when you're on the phone call, and what do I say in the first 30 seconds? Instead of telling what it is you do, stop it. List those problems you fix. Different way. People love that. We have people, homeowners, who are frustrated. Sometimes they find themselves, they're cutting the lawn when they don't want to. Other times they're just fed up with the fact that it doesn't look the way they want to. Or other times you're challenged by the fact that, uh, you know, I don't know, their grass isn't as green as their neighbors. I don't suppose any of these are challenges for you. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But you see how that's different? Rather than I cut lawns and I fertilize, you see, I'm not picking on you all the way. Getting past the game was a uh, tough deal. Um, uh, the biggest thing I can give you there, and it's not like I have any answers. I don't want you to think I got all the answers. I do the best I can, truly. And by the way, everything I share with you today, it doesn't work 100% of the time, so know that. But it does increase your odds, that I know. It does increase your odds. Um, but with regard to, uh, the biggest thing I can say with a gatekeeper is be openly honest, blatantly honest. Hi, this is a cold call, and I'm trying to get a manager to be honest. You'd be amazed, pure honesty, it disarms people. So that's a, that's a way. <clears throat> How do I separate myself from the others? The primary way you separate yourself from the others is you, you ask questions and stop telling. In fact, we have a rule. <clears throat> there should be a 70-30 rule. 70% of the time they're talking, 30% of the time you're talking. I talked about happy. How do I self separate myself from the competition? The way you do that, and how do I make an impression, is by making it about them, not you. It's about them, not you. So this, they'll always start with, well, tell me what you got. I got all kinds of things. Can I ask you a question? What's prominent on your mind? What's the most important challenge you feel you've got as a business owner? And I, and I change it right up. I put it back to them. It's about them. It's not me. I'm not going to go off to the races telling them about Sandler training. What I do, I don't want to do that. If I'm talking, by the way, I'm, I'm sure not helping them buy. Because the only way they're going to buy is if they're I got to get them talking. So I've really ruined this. I've spent more time than I should have, and I do apologize for all busy schedules. 
You've been a great group. I hope this helped a little bit. And I really thank you for having me. And thank you for coming. It means a lot to me that you were here. I really didn't think many people would be coming. This turned out much better than I thought. Um, so have a great day. Go use some of what I taught you. I hope it helps. Have fun. The best thing you've done you got to have fun. Thank you.